Welcome to Flora and Friends, your botanical cup of tea, a podcast for plant lovers of any kind. We welcome guests to our botanical tea break to explore the history, science and meaning of plants for our lives. My name is Judith lundberg felten I'm a plant scientist, university researcher and founder of Flora L Design and I'm the hostess of your botanical cup of tea. A warm welcome to the Flora and Friends podcast for our last episode before a small summer break. Today I am excited to have Melissa and Delphine from the Flora L team here with me. As you may have heard, we are three plant biologists with a big passion for microscopy, but also for crafting with textiles. And in 2019, we created Flora L Design, where we make microscopy um, patterns. So we, we use images from under the microscope of any kind of types of plant and different parts of the plants and different types of microscope and we turn these images into pattern that then are printed on products from textiles to other things and we are just right now developing notebooks for example so we're exploring everything that we can do with our pattern and the idea behind this is to to show people that usually don't sit in front of a microscope, these fascinating structures and these beautiful um, shapes that we discover inside of plants while we do our work as plant scientists, for example. And yes, I have invited Delphine and Melissa to join me on the podcast. And we have talked about where our passion for plants came from, uh, when we really decided to study plants and how we relate to different shapes in plants and what we think is fascinating about plants. And in the end, we have some tips for you as well, how you can be more aware of plants and what you can do about plants and with plants during your summer break. Um, there are some ideas that you can do with family or that you can do on your own. So I hope you enjoy this episode. And with this, I say welcome to Melissa and Delphine. Hello. Hello. Nice that you could join me here today. And we are all three of the Flora L team. I thought we would talk a little bit about our background and what has brought us into wanting to work with plants at all, studying them and then continuing in different ways to, to work with plant science. So maybe let's start with uh, Delphine. What was your first contact with plants and when did you try to, or when did you notice that you liked them a lot and wanted to know more about them? I think my first contact was growing potatoes on my balcony uh, with my mother. I must have been six, something like this. And I just remember it was enough potatoes for my mom to do a little omelette just for me. So it was really tiny, didn't grow very much. Uh, so I think that was my first thing. I mean, I was living all my life uh, until recently in, in apartments. So um, my garden experience was my grandparents' garden where my grandmother were gathering, I was helping her weeding. I always liked being outside, but with plant or in plant science that came much, much later. I mean, biology always has been an interest, nature in general, since a child. But studying plants came when I was choosing university path, I think. Like when I had to decide uh, what I should do and I was very interested by immunology. I remember as a child, my father had a, like a magazine he received every month and one got my attention and I was reading it, uh, I think until I was 20, I was opening this magazine to the same pages that were 3D reconstitution of um, 
macrophage and all the T4, um, I mean, all the immunology was going on. I mean, it's like big things, monster with, I mean, it's just fascinating. And I was looking at that over and over and over again. And I was six when I saw it the first time and it just followed me over years. So fascination for that always been with me. And then I realized that most of them are doctors and I'm not a fan of bloods and everything. And I didn't understand that you could be a doctor, but actually be only in a research lab. For me, a doctor was automatically seeing patients. And I was not so sure I wanted that. And then I always had an interest for plants. My mom especially is a nature lover. So always been outside, showing us the tiny details, like the flowers, a different, not just the color, but how they are made. And she... She's not very, um, she has not a big culture science. She's not at all in the background, but she's just curious by nature. So she was just putting these little details, little like in the front uh, for us to discover, uh, taking tadpoles in a, in a dam and growing them to the being frog at home and jumping everywhere under the sofa. I mean, all these kind of things that just make some of them. It didn't work on my brother, so I think it's not a universal recipe, uh, but it worked very well for me. Science always been a part of um, my my being. I mean, not just plant. I mean, every kind of biology things. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I actually can relate to that because immune, immunolo immunology, <laughs> I can't even pronounce it good as I did not for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and plant biology were the two things I was hesitating of choosing among when I was in my bachelor's. So I went on with plant biology, but uh, I, I really like learning about like, the human body as well. How was that for you, Melissa? When, when did you discover your interest in plants? And was there any key person in your childhood as well who kind of fed that, uh, that desire to learn more? I remember as a kid having a book, like a child's encyclopedia type book, and it was Disney themed. So it had Disney characters like Donald Duck and stuff in it. But one of the books was about botany and it had all these pictures of really interesting plants. And one of the pictures that I remember were these like giant water lilies, like big enough for like people to stand on. And I remember seeing that. And I think as a child, I just thought, I want to live on one of those. <laughs> so I had a childhood like fascination that I could maybe one day live on a lily pad. <laughs> 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 and then it wasn't until in my university I always enjoyed science throughout school and my mom was a school teacher so she always encouraged you know learning at home and and she would do the the tadpole thing with her with her students in class and butterflies and stuff like that so we definitely are kind of a curious and learning family but I didn't think of studying plants. It, a very similar story to you both. I was in university and about halfway through my degree, I was doing a degree in undergraduate neuroscience. So I was really interested in the brain and the human, human body, but specifically how the brain and, ner and the nervous system works. And then I needed a class that fit from like 11 till 12 on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, because I didn't want to mess up my schedule. So I looked through the entire university course listing to try find a class that fat fit in that time slot. And it was a botany class. So I was like, okay, perfect. So sign up for this botany class. And it was a botany class, but it actually, that one wasn't about plants. It was about algae and like algae and fungi together <laughs> and um so that fascinated me though in this course we learned all about like um bioluminescent algae and really weird crazy types of fungi and I was like oh this is so interesting and I ended up switching my degree to plant biology after that and just really really loved that topic and in that first course, we did a lot of microscopy. It was really just looking at different types of organisms. So I think at that same time, kind of a love of microscopy and like seeing the hidden world. Like if you look at like 
a green solution in a flask. It just looks like green water or something. You put it on a microscope slide and you're like, oh my goodness, there is, there's all kinds of stuff going on in there. So that was really fascinating to me. And Delphine, when you were talking about seeing the, the 3D reconstructions, I thought, oh, I wonder if that's where your microscopy um, love came from. It, I got the microscope as a child that was uh, using a lot, like, a, yeah, it's not a toy. It was actually a good one, but not a professional one. I, I was looking at you know, pre-made slides with like a feather from a, a fly or something that you could look through. And that's, I mean, I was looking at it fascinating, but it stopped there. It never went further until I needed it uh, in my different projects. Uh, so uh, I've been doing a lot of microscopy. I mean, as my um, bachelor, I did uh, tr um, TM. Now oh, I forgot the <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for uh, checking uh, plant virus. Uh, and that was fascinating, but it just stopped there. And then during my PhD, I had to do some uh, in-situ hybridization, so light microscopy, and uh, also some cuts of uh, different parts, anatomy uh, cuttings. And that's, I think that's what I like the most because it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's just like a, a precision work with the tiny slice and the colors and things. But I say it stopped there. It was a need, I did it and stopped. And it really, exploded during my postdoc because all my postdoc was about microscopy because I was looking at, uh, uh, I mean, inside the cells at tiny little organelles. So, but this was mostly confocal microscopy and it's a love and hate relationship because as much as I like to see what, what's happening, I hate it to be in this dark room for hours and hours and hours. This is what also what is, Maybe people do not think about that, but microscopy is often in a closed room without a window. Uh, for light microscopy, a bit less, but for confocal, it's just like, it's a beautiful day outside, the sun is shining, now you're five hours in a cave. Um, and I have to say, after years and years of microscopy, it's starting to be tough on, uh, on my uh, mental health. Uh, so I diverted often by taking beautiful pictures. Not, not the one I was meant to do, but just to make it something a bit funny. I was, oh, that's nice. Let's take that. So I was taking like 10 minutes of time to just make something that was not my project. That's just something that was luring me of making it funnier than just being in the dark room for hours. Um, so, yeah, I'd say it's just, it just came naturally in my project. It's nothing I consciously chose at any time. Judith also started very, uh, I think you started already, uh, at least in PhD, to do some many microscopy time. I actually, uh, you know, I came into plant biology a little bit on a side way as well. It was, it was, yeah, I did uh, study biochemistry, so I didn't do any microscopy there. Lots of calculations, organic chemistry and other things. And then I came to France and I started working on a project that was obligatory in a greenhouse. Uh, and I just loved being in a greenhouse. And I realized that when you study plants, you can see them from seed to seed. You can see the whole organism developing and you can treat it with things. You can see what happens to the organism in the different stages. Uh, and I found that was really interesting. And that convinced me in the end why I wanted to continue with plant biology and not uh, immunology. But uh, and then I I moved on and I, I studied in in Lyon for my masters and there I studied how the pollen is recognized by the papilla cells on on the female part of the flower and there's these beautiful images of a pollen that is uh, growing a pollen tube into these female parts of the uh, of the plant and it looks like a bouquet of flowers and then you have it fluorescent under the microscope and I did this thing and I was like wow this is beautiful and there was a lot of experiments that that failed I was trying to do in situ hybridization at that time and it was a difficult material to work with 
But I was just so happy to sit in front of the microscope and to look at whatever I could see. I was doing screening all kinds of lines that had fluorescence in different parts of the plant just to find one line that I could use. Uh, but I saw lots of things and some of these fluorescent, like if you look at the trichomes, which has like small hairs almost on a, on a leaf and they have like, they split in, uh, well, on that plant they split into three and there was the fluorescence in. So when I would look at the leaf, it would look like small stars, like a sky <laughs> with stars. And I, I could, can also relate to that, that I was sitting in front of the microscope and just sometimes taking images that were beautiful just because I had no objective with them and I didn't know what would happen with them. But I just thought, this is so cool. I need to show this to somebody. I need to share this. So there, there was my, my love for the microscopy. And then I, I really looked for projects for my PhD where microscopy was a part of it because I wanted to know more and I, I enjoyed doing this even though it meant sitting in dark rooms sometimes and you would lose completely any sense for day season whatever it could be snowing outside or being 30 degrees you sit there and you don't know anything but it's an it's an experience it's also you need a lot of patience when sitting at the microscope because it's not quick. It's usually not high throughput. It's image by image and settings correctly. And you want to get it all in focus. And um, it's, it's tricky work as well to get the best image. And even sample preparation is lots. But uh, I enjoy this so much. And I, I like, you know, we are, I'm teaching a course after the summer at the university where I will teach microscopy and sample preparation to students together with some colleagues and it's just it's just a pleasure for me <laughs> how is how is that for you melissa what did you think was the most annoying or the best thing about microscopy i always really enjoyed doing microscopy and i did a lot of um, fresh section hand sectioned microscopy and I got really good at doing thin sections by hand. So I always preferred to do that. I found if you had to do like a full sample preparation, it takes so long. You have to dehydrate the tissues and replace with um, a different solvent and put it in wax and set. like it's so much longer. I like the instant gratification of like cutting a part of the plant, doing some quick slices and seeing what it looks like immediately. When I, I did a lot of microscopy in my PhD, I was studying flax fiber development. And in the literature, there wasn't a ton of information about like how the flax phloem fibers develop. They knew they came from procambium tissue, but there wasn't a lot of information about how and when and where those cells form. So I spent a lot of time sectioning, hand sectioning stems at different locations and trying to track the the visual development of the fibers within the stem and that was such I think it was such an important part of my research just for me understanding kind of the three-dimensional structure and the timing and the placement of where these cells are forming and it just gave me such a good um like grounding for the molecular work that I did on it later I was able to really define different stages of like, okay, I know at this point in the stem, at this height, the fibers are doing exactly this, they're elongating. And at this other point, they've started to put down their cell walls. So by having like a really good microscopic view of my model system, I was able to do better research because of it. So I, I always enjoyed doing that. And we had a vibratome, an old vibratome in the lab. I think my supervisor like found it somewhere. <laughs> No one knew how to work it. So I like Googled a manual that I thought might match the machine and figured out how to work it. And I think I was one of the only people who ever used this thing, but I used it all the time. And it ended up doing really good sections under the vibratome as well, which was also still fresh, fresh mm -hmm. tissue. So fast and quick. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed that. I did a bit more microscopy at UPSC when I was doing po my postdoc there. Yeah, actually a lot of fresh sections again, a lot of Arabidopsis light microscopy and then a bit of TEM or not T, yeah, TEM, yeah, TEM on wood. 
Um, but I found I didn't like the TEM so much because I was kind of disconnected from the sample prep itself. Mm. I, I don't know who made the samples, but there was just samples ready for me to look at. Mm. <laughs> so that, that was a different process than that really thorough investigation that I had done previously where I was, you know, working with the plant and picking the exact tissue and, and kind of mapping it out mentally. Mm. I think that's the problem with the confocal microscopy I did. I mean, you have you have to prep your tissue. It's taking a couple of days. I mean, not always. Sometimes you can look at them live, but it it's it took me a while. I was I mean, I was no one was here to teach me, so it took me a while just to learn how the root was made, where I was, because you blindly go through like layers of tissues. And what does it look like? Where, where I'm looking at the epidermal cells. I'm looking at the... So it just took me... I had the first six months was a bit of a stress every time because I was like nervous. What do I, what am I looking at? Because you just have dark and things like fluorescing here and there. <laughs> um, but once that step was over, when I was getting confident about what I was doing, then things was much better. And for me, I think the confocal, so we had a very old confocal at the beginning when I started. And the problem with that, you, you had to look through the, you call, what do you call that, the eyepiece all the time. You couldn't look on the screen, you know, directly. And as I have glasses, I had a very hard time because I was disconnected. I, had, I always have a hard time to look through the eyepiece and be in the object uh, because I always have distance. And it was giving me headache because I had to follow all the time. And when we got the new confocal and I could look on this big screen when I was doing without having this eyepiece, then I was feeling I was inside. And then my pleasure increased dramatically. I mean, the experience was much better um, when we got this new new equipment. So I think it's, it's it, for me, it was really like a, and I say I was getting headaches. So being four hours in the, in the dark and then I was going home with like a, a head like Bonding, uh, bouncing, uh, yeah. That that was my bad experience. But it got much better after. Good equipment can help. <laughs> mm. Equipment is uh, certainly a very important part in in microscopy. I think Melissa said something also important there with the hand sectioning. I think you actually taught me how to use a carrot <laughs> to do sectioning. So <laughs> as a sample hold. <laughs> <laughs> And I learned that from my supervisor, Tata, at the time. So I yeah. can't take credit for that, but I'm sure <laughs> as well. That was a very interesting process. I have actually, you know, I've actually recorded a video on that. And uh, I think we should post that together with the podcast on our Instagram this week so uh, that you can see how carrots can be used for that. That's a, so such a smart solution <laughs> to use a carrot as a sample holder. But I, I can see that sample preparation can be very, very frustrating. And not always when you start with a new material, it, it's not always so clear how to prepare the samples. When we need to like section it in very, very thin slices, I mean, sometimes it's you can do it by hand. Sometimes you do it in a carrot. Sometimes you put like a gel around it to make it stable enough. Sometimes you need to put it into wax and sometimes you need to put it into epoxy resin, which is really hard. And then you can use from a razor blade to a diamond knife to, to cut it, depending on what you have put it in. Has that ever been an issue for you to know, to not knowing how to exactly prepare your sample, depending on what you wanted to see? I mean, I can talk first. Um, in my case, never been a problem because I always had one clear experience and I was taught by one person. So I was just following blindly, adjusting at time, but I, I just was trusting the person that was a professional. Um, but it's clear that sometimes I had this like idea, I should do that. And then I didn't know. I didn't know what was the best way. Uh, so at UPC, it's such a big institute that you quickly find a person that knows. For, for, for uh, not always accurately, uh, but I can hint you and help you. So it would never be a such, a, such a problem at UPSC because I say it's a big institute and you always find people with knowledge in uh, what you want to do. 
Yeah, I agree with that. I never really had an issue with that, I think, because I did a lot of fresh sectioning and it was just tending to work and probably due to the, the age and type of the samples, like you were mentioning, you did like, yeah, if you're sectioning wood, it's very different than sectioning something very small and tender, like, like a anther or something. So depending on what you're doing, but I was always doing kind of small herbaceous stems, um, kind of like a, like the size and hardness of a dandelion stem. So they were always kind of fine to do by hand. And like Delphine said, yeah, when I came to do TEM, there were people who were experts and, and knew what to do. And usually for, if you're working on a organism that's been fairly well studied, you you'll you can find either in the literature or from other people like what's the best way to do this if you're working on something brand new or something really really specific or something that might um, be sensitive to different chemical processes in in the sample prep then you might have you're going to have a bit more trouble i think mm -hmm. but i didn't have that i have not known uh, all kinds of sites of losing fluorescence of fluorophores when trying to prepare the samples and i've been working with roots and to see how they interact with fungi in the soil with beneficial fungi and that has been a, a big challenge when you do cross sections it's a bit easier but when you want to do like longitudinal sections to really look inside the root that has been a, and is still a challenge for us. We have been trying lots of different things. So microscopy is not always so straightforward when one tries to see a specific part of a, a plant and material can be very thick and yet too soft to section and that makes it, makes it hard. Is it a challenge because you're looking at two different types of material like a plant and a fungal material? Does that make it harder to find one kind of sample processing that works for both? That can be, that can be because the root that is interacting with the fungus is much thicker and much more stable. So that sample is usually easier to prepare as compared to a root that is on its own. And I then need to, we need to always find sample preparation methods that work for both a thinner root and a thick uh, root that is interacting with uh, and surrounded by fungus so that's uh, that makes uh, things challenging and also whenever you have thicker material and you try to like get any kind of dye inside the material because in microscopy we we work a lot with dyes to reveal certain molecules that are polymers for example And they will just stay in the outermost cells and never go really inside the tissue. So there's all kind of challenges to that. And then also working with dyes is uh, maybe a part also that not many people know is that uh, when you work with staining your samples under the microscope and all this, all these sample preparation methods or many of them work with lots of toxic products. So there's lots of security um education necessary for being able to safely work with that and uh, that obviously is restricts the possibility for people to do microscopy with these stainings outside of a laboratory environment where all the safety regulations and uh, infrastructure exists Yeah, but from uh, the lab, we have taken these images and gone to doing something very different to them when we make pattern from them. How do you experience that process of making a pattern out of a microscopy image where you, where you know what you see when you look at the microscopy image and then you make a pattern of it? Can you recognize the, the structures when you see somebody else's pattern? Yes, yeah, three people. Sometimes it's one of us who makes it. Uh, And what do, you, what do you like about that? Maybe we can start with, with Melissa. I think because I have such a love of botany and microscopy, I usually, and since I'm fam like, we're generally working with plants and I'm pretty familiar with the um, anatomy of plants microscopically. So I can tell where the original um, cells are coming from, but it's always fascinating to see. We've done it a few times where we have all made different patterns from similar starting material images. And, and each one of us comes up with very different ways of creating a pattern from a single image. I think what that comes from is maybe just 
we each can focus in on some different aspect of the original image that we find interesting or think of a way that we could make it interesting by making the pattern repeat in a certain way. So it's always, it's always fun to see the different ways that we can take the same starting material and come up with something different. But usually even though it's different, I can still tell what cells it was or that it's some sort of plant microscopy image. I still recognize that usually in the final product. Yeah, that's a skill I don't have. I mean, my uh, anatomy uh, knowledge is really low. Um, I, I, I honestly, I'm so, I suck at it. I can recognize dots. If you give me a confocal image, I can tell you that a Golgi or if it's a, if it's a trans Golgi network or whatever. I'm much more familiar with the intracellular anatomy than the organ anatomy. So uh, clearly, uh, I have I have a few ideas, but I might be also wrong. Uh, for making the pattern, I think. What I like the most, I, I, I'm not very good at 3D. So I always had a problem due to my eyes with 3D reconstruction. Even at, at school, when they had to organic chemistry, I had a lot of trouble, you know, to try to find how things were positioned. That's a nightmare. And the same with the pattern. Like people can take a bit and automatically in the head try to see what, I, what we look like at the end. I don't. I have really like manually to put them side by side and say, oh, yeah, it looks like this. And then moving the things and realizing that it gives a complete other uh, image at the end. So I think it's, I think it's, this is a very fun part, like trying to pick uh, a little section and like adding them to another, uh, I mean, to, to the same section and turning it. And then you, you can really, at the end, give a complete other feeling to the pattern from exactly the same section. Uh, and after I am a color person, so I love color. So for me, all the things that were studied in blue are my favorite because I like the shades it gives, like from the blue, pink, purple, and a little of green. I, I, it's just such a lovely color combination uh, that I am automatically drawn to those ones. Uh, more than others, um, but that's just because, yeah, say I am, I like, I love colors and I can tweak the colors forever. I can, I could spend hours just like, no, not this one, no, not this one. Yeah, a little bit more clear. Little bit. I think this is the fascinating part, but also it could be, it could take five days and you can have 2000 options for the same patterns. So you have to say that's, that's good enough now. <laughs> good that it is. I think that's ex especially the very fascinating thing about making pattern that you can get so many different structures by just uh, choosing a different part of the microscopy image and even working in different ways with the microscopy images. Sometimes we, we mirror and we put them together and we repeat this. Sometimes we cut out pieces and we arrange them ourselves to get more airy shapes. And then even though there is common parts of anatomy inside plants, there's always structures that are slightly bit different. And we also haven't done like, well, we have done a lot of stems of different plants and there is, you find, you find things that are going to be the same, yet the pattern still always looks different depending on how we stained it, where we sectioned it, how we sectioned it and which part we choose then to make the pattern. So it's a, it's a lot of variation. It's an even bigger variation than nature provides itself because we choose a part of it to make something new with it. And I think I, I like that a lot and to get more like you get some graphic structures then you get very organic shapes as well it's all a mixture and it's uh gives such a large variety also depending on which kind of images we start with when we start with electron microscopy images they are by nature black and white they are more like x-ray images so that gives a completely different aspect than what delphine mentioned the tolvidin blue stained ones or when we image on the confocal uh, we image fluorescence, that's basically also black and white image, but also then very different than electron microscopy image. So that, that whole variety is, uh, is I, I love that. <laughs> so many different aspects. 
Yeah. Is there, let's come to, to, I have three last questions here, a little bit more general on plans. Um, if there, is there a place that is famous or that you think is very interesting for their plans and that you would like to visit anywhere in the world, wherever, or that you maybe have already visited? Maybe a place with big lily pads for Melissa? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, that would be on my list. I think you can see them at the Kew Gardens, like, uh, what's that place called? Conservatory. Um, I would also really love to see baobab trees in Madagascar. They're, they're like these really weird looking, weird looking trees with like really fat kind of shiny stems and just like scraggly branches I was gonna say arms but they're not arms <laughs> they're branches <laughs> at the top so I'd love to see that that's just it's so otherworldly that I've never seen anything quite like that um I also I also really love going to um Vancouver Island or like the the Pacific Northwest area of North America and there's um big uh cedar rainforest there so that's mm. I've been there but I, I love going there mm -hmm. Uh, for me, I wouldn't, I couldn't say. Um, I just know that I love when it's juicy green. So I've been, I've been traveling a lot through a job, and uh, I have a, a father that traveled a lot. So we, we went to different places, and though very warm and dry country, I, I'm very appealing for their climate. It's too dry. It, it doesn't it it doesn't please my soul uh, I like this like very juicy and intense green so uh, more for uh, France works perfectly well even Sweden where we live when it's green is really like lush green uh, but even tropical countries when it's really like a going everywhere like leaves of different sizes of different shapes going in one another this is more my kind of um, of paradise uh, though I like in the south of France when you go to lavender season when all these all the fields are purple this is something that I really really enjoy but it's it's for an instance I wouldn't like to live in there but it's beautiful for the eyes it's just like a and it smells so good as well um, yeah so more not to dry climate Mm -hmm. most rain is good <laughs> <laughs> you would enjoy ireland you should go there that's really really lush and green i like that i i i'm kind of an intermediate i'm both a landscape person i like landscapes that are beautiful and i i like to see plants and like as part of a landscape I was very surprised going to New Zealand because that is from the climate very like Europe, but the plants are not at all. They have, I don't remember, 130, it could have been varieties of ferns. Mm. And the whole forest were full of ferns. And it's like, I was amazed how different the landscapes were there despite the climate being so alike. So going to a different place and seeing that is, is definitely something I have enjoyed and seeing the redwood forest there with these mm. gigantic trees, that trees can become so old. Well, I also enjoy watching uh, David Attenborough's yes. <laughs> movies and traveling, uh, traveling through that. But there's, um, I, th I think I don't have, necessarily a preferred landscape having done the podcast and heard about people traveling even in very like alpine regions where there's not many plants and still looking for these tiny things the tiny plants and what is really there is something i enjoy i and i enjoy both house plants and i enjoy um like the first plants that come out in in the forest and looking at them i enjoy having cultured plants in my garden I can't really say that is I, I have like a very favorite place, but I have, uh, I love visiting botanical gardens and yeah. seeing unusual plants and especially when they are using landscapes so that you can see about where they are from or arboretums where that's also nice. So 
It's hard to say for me, but I, in Umeå, I have definitely enjoyed going to the Arboretum and here in Uppsala, I enjoy uh, passing by the, the tropical greenhouse and there's also very, very big lily pads in there. <laughs> I'm going to think of you. <laughs> nice. I was, I was just remembering, I think the last time we were together in person, Judith, we were in a botanical garden in Nantes. So, yeah. you know, maybe not the last moment we were together, but that was... We did that, I think, on the last day. I think botanical garden is a must. I mean, everywhere I go, I'm checking the botanical garden. Mm. I think I almost visited them in every city where they were one. Um, as it, it's always such a nice place to be. Mm. Um, yeah. You have changed jobs a little bit since uh, we were all in Umeå and were postdocs and doing lots of microscopy in, in dark <laughs> rooms in the basement. Um, how are plants uh, today an important part of your life? Um, I mean, for me, um, since I quit working as a researcher, I'm also a house owner and I have a big, big garden. Um, so this is bringing my peace. I mean, I'm never as much as peace as when I'm outside and have just the bird sounds and the leaves flapping with the wind. This is where I'm myself. So I, I, I mean, plants give me shade when it's warm. <laughs> they are giving me flowers. They're giving me colors. I mean, they are giving me everything. Um, my house is a tree house. So they gave me that as well. They give me my clothes. I mean, I am. Uh, we are working with linen because we believe it's a better uh, fiber for to um, for, for more sustainable fiber to use for clothing. But I'm very conscious of everything that is environmental, so I'm always conscious to what I'm buying. Which um, so it's. I think it's it's every minute of my life is about plants. Basically, my tea now. If it was a verbena tea tonight, but a bit of plants. So <laughs> it's, uh, I say it's almost every minute of my life is about plants. You're very conscious about the, the plants around you. That's nice. Yes. I don't think everybody is. So that's, uh, that's a lot of appreciation you have for plants in your everyday life. How is it for you, Melissa? I, I see the world very much like Delphine and I'm always maybe not always aware, but conscious of the fact that the air we breathe is coming from photosynthesis. So like we really have a symbiotic relationship with the plants on earth that we rely on each other to, to be here. Um, for my job though, since I, I've left research and I work now though at a university, but in, um, in the educational side of things. So I don't work on plants anymore and I don't have any opportunity to do microscopy anymore in my job, but I do work um, with an ecology course. And so some of our labs, so I'm a lab coordinator for an ecology course. So the students do three hours of classroom work every week and then three hours of uh, projects and experiments. And so I'm um, coordinating the experiment side of it. So we do some, um, outdoor surveys of um, vegetation in the river valley close to where the university is. So I'm in those labs in particular, I'm always trying to like encourage uh, a love of plants and an appreciation of plants to the students. Cause there is a lot of, a lot of ecology can focus on plants, but m many ecologists also study animals or weather patterns or other types of um, things related to ecology. So for those plant labs though, I really try to, to help the students and the TAs I work with see like a, a fascinating side of plants and to get them to just really look at plants as something exciting and not boring green stuff. <laughs> yes, no, plants are no boring green stuff. <laughs> I not agree here. with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for me, plants are really everywhere i mean still doing doing research teaching and research uh, sometimes i'm helping with experiments um 
it's just uh, and then at home I have my my house plants and uh, I have a garden and it's basically all about plants. Then we have Florel and then it's all the cushions and everything <laughs> at home <laughs> reminds me of microscopy and plants and I enjoy that a lot and I enjoy a lot learning about uh, textiles from plants because there's not just cotton and linen there's new uh, invasive plants that are turned into um, into textiles as well and uh, even soy as a replacement for silk and it's fascinating what kind of technological developments there are made to to use plants in a different way as well but also to grow them in different ways to make the cities greener and uh, all kind of aspects of uh, from plants in offices where we have them a lot in Sweden for good work environment and work atmosphere and uh, to to green cities and yeah plants are everywhere around us and as Melissa said due to them we are here if we we don't take care of them we will never not be here anymore either so an important part to to remember do you have any plant-related tips for summer vacation that is coming up? Delphine. Botanical gardens. Go to every botanical garden you find you cross. Uh, I mean, I born and raised in France, living in Sweden now for many years, but still my vacation, I'm return, return to France. So I would say like, yeah, as I say, south of France, when you have the lavender field in the summer, and then you have uh, like a, a place when you're just growing bamboos. So the whole garden is just a bamboo. So you have the gigantic one, the one growing almost by the eyes when you see them growing like a, like a one centimeter every, I don't know if it's, I think it's 10 centimeters a day, those fast growing ones. So that's a beautiful park, not just because it's for the for the eyes, but I'm very sensitive to sound. And the bamboo um, with the wind is just a wonderful sound. It's just like this, like tiny. It's really relaxing. I think many of this Zen music must have a bamboo leaves flopping in the wind because it's a relaxing sound. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm gonna say just look at botanical gardens. That's always a good place to start, and from that on you find uh, yeah things to discover from that on mm -hmm. not need to go far away with this covid times anyway it's, it's travel and i'm becoming also very conscious of my, my flying so i'm trying to um, think twice before i'm uh, booking a uh, plane tickets I'm going to say from my ecology viewpoint i'm going to say i'm going to challenge people to maybe when they go outside to try to figure out some of the names of some of the plants that are around them, get like a, a field guide for the area where you live and see if you can identify a plant. And as soon as you start looking at the plants more closely, you realize, oh, there is so much diversity right in front of me that I never noticed. Like I think a lot of people can walk by a forest and just think it's like green just like green is what they would call it. But when you actually look, you can see, oh, there's this type of plant and this type of plant and a little short grass and something more bushier and they're all different and they all have different leaves. And that becomes really interesting when your eyes can be trained to see plants as individual things and not just kind of a wall of green that's in the background. Mm -hmm. That's very true. I would say for me having a garden and now we, we gave our our kids uh, an own planting box and a bunch of seeds so they are growing things there themselves. So I think that's a nice idea for doing if you have family to just make grow something even if you just take a pod and you you may grow watercress at home that you can eat they put some peas and you have like the pea uh, the the green of the peas you can eat so there's some easy things that you can do even if you don't have a big garden yeah, but sugar I, snaps sugar they snaps yeah very, they work very, well and what i would say is melissa talked about the diversity i am 
I'm fascinated by plant development. So just to look and observe how a plant develops from a seed that is germinating into a plant. I love to see pea plants. They have these uh, tendrils that are trying to catch on to something. And to observe that, just how are they doing this? It's like, how do they know that it's there? And there's, there's suddenly so many questions that come up when you observe both the diversity and the development. How is this plant doing this? How does the plant know? How is the plant sensing its environment? So there's lots of things about plants that you can look at. And I also find that weeding is a very mindful activity. Yeah. So if you're stressed, just take 10 minutes and rip out some weeds. If you find any kind of <laughs> patch of soil, um, you need to really carefully look what you take and what is a weed and what not, because the weeds like to resemble the plants that you want to have growing there. <laughs> so uh, even that is a good activity that can be, if you think about it in a positive way, it can be very nice and relaxing as well. I'm, I'm teaching after 10 years working with a habidopsis. I'm teaching my, uh, my daughters to rip it out <laughs> as, soon, as soon as they see one. <laughs> this one, take it out. <laughs> so they will be also very familiar with our habidopsis, like their mom. Yes. <laughs> That's the first step into science. Thank you. Thank you very much for today, for sharing your experiment experience with going into science, with doing microscopy and your relationship to plants. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. I hope you have enjoyed this episode and uh, gotten to know us a bit more of the Flora L team. If you would like to see what we are doing, I invite you to uh, visit our blog post associated to this podcast at www.flora-l.com forward slash blog and you will find some images and some different uh, materials related to the process of how we design patterns, some insights from the lab as well. So you're welcome to visit this also to get a visual impression of what we are doing. And as we are going into the summer break, I would like to invite you, if you want to learn more about plants, to go over to Caitlin and listen to her podcast. It's called the Flora Fanga Podcast. And she is having exciting interviews with different scientists to explore how plants interact with mushrooms or fungi as we call them uh, and what it is all about of of the, the fung fungal world is we are covering more the plant world she is more into the fungal world but also the interaction with plants and I myself uh, was really delighted to um, be invited to her podcast and to be interviewed there so um, here is Caitlin with a little teaser about her podcast. So enjoy listening to this and I will put the link to her podcast also in the show notes. And we will be back here on the Flora and Friends podcast in August for more episodes about plants and how they interact with us humans and how they influence us today and back in history. So with that, I wish you a lovely summer. Enjoy. And for those living on the southern hemisphere, we wish you a lovely winter. So uh, have a good time and we see you back here in August. Hello, who's ready to get down and nerdy? I'm Caitlin Keen, a plant biologist with a thirst for mycology. If you're into science and other interesting biology topics, listen to my new podcast, Flora Funga Podcast, releasing February 10th, where I dive into topics like how plants and fungi communicate with each other. I also cover how mushrooms can help save the world by breaking down plastics and radiation. Did you know that the smell of fresh cut grass is actually the plant screaming for help? Terrifying or that plants carry the same disease genes that humans do? What? Learn more fun tidbits like these by subscribing to Flora Funga Podcast. I'll be releasing new episodes every other week. Check the show notes to find the link to my website, florafungapodcast.com. I can't wait to learn and grow with you. Hope to see you soon. 
Have a great week, my scientists, and go learn something new today. <laughs>